Good morning, everyone. And for those that are right down the back, feel free to move forward so we actually have a bit more of an of a, uh, engaging group up the front. Good morning. Welcome to day two of our World Geospatial Information Congress. I'm hoping everyone that was here today was at the dinner last night and had an absolutely wonderful time. I know, I know, if you did not have a wonderful time last night, that's a problem. But thank you to all of our hosts and colleagues. It was an absolutely fantastic night last evening. My name's Greg Scott. I'm um, in the UNGJM Secretariat um, in New York, and I've had the absolute pleasure to work with our colleagues in India, the Department of Science and Technology and Geospatial World and, and many other partners to bring this Congress together um, this week. So it's, it's been an absolute ride and, and certainly last night was a reflection of that. So, so welcome once again. We've got a, a discussion today that um, is really starting to look at the future and we decided when we're putting the program together for the Congress is to put a number of special sessions together where we could actually have a bit of an interactive dialogue and discussion. And in that context, we've got this session on the future geospatial information ecosystem. And I'm really, really privileged to have a very distinguished group of experts with us today. And just by way of outline, we're going, to, we're going to convene this special session in two parts. Number one, we're going to have three experts. Um, and thank you, Zafar, you're, you're, you're here. Um, so I was sort of stalling for a minute. Um, welcome, and I hope your foot is feeling much better. Um, we are doing this in two parts, where we've got three presenters that are going to talk about this topic. And then following that, we will add another five expert panelists from around the world to actually have a bit of an interactive discussion. And there's microphones in the room that you can see, and we hopefully will be able to bring you and invite you to that discussion through this process. So without further ado, we have our first three panelists. Um, and it goes without saying, these folks know a bit or two about where we're heading in the world. But let me give a bit of context. UNGGIM is an intergovernmental committee that's been established in the United Nations. It does a lot of work around establishing frameworks and methods and standards and looking at, in general, the policy directions that countries are taking around the world. Part of that is also thinking about the future. And in thinking about the future, it's how do we bring, as we move forward with technology development, and we think of the way that the evolution of the geospatial ecosystem with the broader global data ecosystem is moving, and how do we do this in a way where we, as we term, bridge the geospatial digital divide. And that's a big challenge, because as we leap forward, at the same time we need to be able to bring those furthest behind with us. And this is part of the context of the theme of this Congress, when we think about geo-enabling the global village, but more importantly, to ensure that we do not leave anyone behind, especially at the local level. So this discussion is going to think about what that future geospatial ecosystem looks like, and it's also part of the work of UNGGIM as we think about what that means, how that comes about, and how do we move towards some of the elements that are part of that. So, to set that frame and context, I've got three wonderful folks today that are going to introduce and give you an overview of what that future may look like, and the elements that are required as we think about those components, because it's really thinking, saying, where will we be in 5, 10, 15 years? Where is geospatial 
in 5, 10, 15 years, and where is that ecosystem in that period of time. So to start off, I'm going to invite, I will call as a, a good friend, Zafar, but in fact, uh, Dr. Zafar Zakiq Mohammed Goose, who's the director uh, and advisory for AAM, which is a Woolpert company. Um, Zafar has been in a journey with us and thinking about some of this work over the last two years and developing papers towards this. Following Zafar, we will also have Ms. Ananya Narain, who's also part of Geospatial World. She's the director of consulting and has done a lot of work in thinking about the metrics and analytics around the future ecosystem. And then we will finish off with Dr. Leslie Arnold from Geospatial Frameworks in Australia. And I say finish off with Dr. Leslie Arnold, but in fact the brains behind all of this is Dr. Leslie Arnold. So, um, and you'll see how all that comes together from our three presentations. So without further ado, I'm gonna get away. I'm gonna invite Safar. Are you okay to stand or would you like to go from there? Um, and we'll go through the three panelists' discussions and then we'll bring up our extra um, contributors after that. So Zafar, the floor is yours. Thank you. Good day. My name is Zafar Mohammed Gauss. I like to uh, acknowledge the land where I come from, uh, the Wurundjeri land, and pay my respect to the elders past, present, and emerging. And this is a way in Australia we acknowledge the traditional landowners and happy to be here. So in the next two, seven to eight minutes, uh, I have this setting up of this scene on geospatial ecosystems and how they differ from SDIs. By putting that statement, a lot of efforts and initiatives has gone on SDIs. So we're not saying throw away SDIs, how they have evolved and how geospatial ecosystem is bringing a view of integrating modern approaches, technologies, processes, and policies being inclusive of not leaving any SDI behind. Right? So that's the concept of ecosystem, and it has been built on uh, looking at ecological ecosystems. So that's the sort of the concept. And I had the opportunity to work with about 12 to 13 experts, which also Greg was involved in, and, and probably we didn't have better things to do during the pandemic, isn't it, Greg? And, <laughs> and we spent about 50 meetings to, to bring this thought process, and then uh, Ananya and Leslie took it further and, 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 and have come up with this nice uh, work linking from those sort of concepts and they will further work on this. So uh, this is just to provide some uh, background on new and emerging conditions that is as a consultant you do a future state and what is the current state. So the future state is around what's emerging what are the conditions? That's what you see on this side. On the other side, you see the impact on SDIs. So when SDIs were developed, they were developed and were relevant for those times there. It had five pillars. Uh, it was more around data and technology focus, but now uh, are these SDI platforms ready for uh, IoT, the, 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 the fourth industrial revolution? Are they ready to disseminate this, this massive amount of big data, et cetera? And those are the challenges. But also now more ethics is also being spoken across, privacy is being spoken across, uh, and then there's a lot of data on the web and, and how they talk to each other. So the traditional SDIs or when they were evolved, uh, those sort of challenges were not there. And this is where these emerging conditions as Location in decision making will be a common place. We see that with Uber reaching over here, ordering food, everything has become ubiquitous. New geospatial data source and services. So, so at that time, SDI concepts were all about emerging collection of new producers of data and services. Metadata were static, but now search engines require more information. 
and uh, and and also they were a uh, lot of uh, earth observation advancements has taken place with high resolution imagery coming up lidar data is required more and more so these sort of challenges the volume the scale and also expectation of this to be served on your mobile device is what folks are looking for so technological advancements are there and 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 again developing countries need good sdi practice example that are based on modern technologies I was just in one of the previous meetings said uh, modern technologies and new technologies are not just for developing countries a good use case is how do we leapfrog the developing countries is digital earth africa is an excellent example where digital earth australia try to use landsat images they developed this code on open source platform and gifted that go uh, that code to to the globe but also handheld in the mission of digital earth africa and and now they have this technology of course with all other players geo and other people coming along so uh, the myth or the perception is this metaverse and things does not apply for developing countries i challenge that statement we could leapfrog the developing or underdeveloped countries do not have to take step 1 step 2 they can reach the third floor directly with those technology i hope all my colleagues could agree to that next slide please <clears throat> and again automation and analytics every presentation you would have heard ai ml every speaker would use this words uh, and and probably it'll be nice to see a cloud word count on it a cloud on that how it has evolved so again those sdi is at that time where the architecture that had uh, was 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 more static and and i think now we need to have uh, the ecosystems be able to support that real time analytics automation uh, and user expectation it's around the supply driven sdis um, uh, and 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 uh, supply driven sdis cannot provide the geospatial data and visualization and organizations are changing drastically and and governments are uh, now looking at more taking a step back as regulator and more market forces to look at those products next slide so this is just a visual to see that sdi is a component of the ecosystem not throwing it away we are taking the well formed uh, products services whatever it is but it's more around if you look at the 6g uh, the 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 cyber security uh and 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 cybernetics platforms but also models as service we have seen data as a service and so on and so forth but now people are also sharing their workflows openly as well the ecosystems evolve next slide so this is a concept uh around it where everything every uh, entity is an actor and you have the consumers at the center and then you have the 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 uh what you call uh the thematics if you like at the periphery and everything is interconnected you have igif gki open analytics quantum computing this is all sort of a concept it's a concept right it's not uh a, a something implemented it's just a concept how do we bring everyone along and over here it's about how in a natural ecosystem things evolve two ecosystems form uh, come together to form a new ecosystem some ecosystem die so that's the concept of what, how ecological things or natural things have evolved so so based on that this has disseminated and they are all interconnected that's the message next so so as i said it's it's a concept drawing on the knowledge on natural ecosystem and community of actors its individuals organizations um also if in a mature geospatial ecosystem we anticipate public good geospatial information can be accessed easily uh and there are certain examples there but it's also about the ecosystem is dynamic and and i think there are so many answers around how the governance of this ecosystem will take place is it self governed 
how do we bring legal process to it. So, all this needs to be underpinned. But it's a concept, it's evolving, but my other colleagues can provide more details of how it could work. Next. And this is about the actors may form collaborations for specific purpose, and there are multitude of stakeholders, and there's a variety of goods and services that may disseminate out of the ecosystem. You don't know what the answers might be, and, and, and some good services can evolve. But, uh, but they all result from a sophisticated chain of geoprocessing events. And at the last, it's a harmonized search of an ecosystem may potentially give the information that's required for governments, perhaps for NGOs or universities. Still, deliberately, I have not put the commercial model in, and, and it needs to be worked out. Uh, but I'm sure the concept of marketplace of bringing private sector data and taking advantage of an ecosystem can help evolve. But the maturity around the transactions needs to be explored. With that, um, my last slide is, next slide please, is to say thank you uh, for your attention and, um, and hopefully this concept evolves and that's what the title of this future of geospatial ecosystem is and my colleagues can provide more details from here. Thanks for the opportunity. Thank you, Safar. Um, and some really key messages there is that none of this is hardwired. This is really about a bit like a nervous system. It's an ecosystem that's evolving, it's developing. And what does that look like? And we all are part of that process. Um, and, and I think that's really important. It's not one thing or the other. And we're seeing the fact that spatial data infrastructures are also evolving at the same time and changing. And the question is, how do we get in front of that? How do we think about what some of that looks like? And now I'd like to ask Ananya to come up and talk a little bit more about some of the metrics in, in that process. So Ananya, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Um, it's truly a pleasure being here with the esteemed set of speakers that we have here and the panelists that we have here. Somebody who comes from a non-geospatial background, somebody who comes from economics, understanding the future geospatial ecosystem has been a privilege. Uh, I have had an opportunity to look at the future geospatial ecosystem from, from an outside point of view. And uh, today, uh, I get to present with these esteemed set of speakers the, the view that why do we need a future geospatial ecosystem? Why do we need to now start thinking about a future geospatial ecosystem, whatever it may named be in the future? So the topic of my presentation is drivers for change and the technologies uh, enabling change. And I think a lot of this the drivers, the technologies that are coming forth are going to establish why and what should be the component of the future geospatial information ecosystem. So when we look at macro drivers for change, we have clubbed it into three key macro drivers. One is equitable access. Second is bridging the geospatial divide. And third is making sure that those solutions, those innovative geospatial solutions reach out to the local communities. If you were all there in the plenary yesterday, there was one question that was asked uh, by somebody on uh, zoo animals, if the geospatial technology is reaching to the ground level. And I think that, that, that question kind of sets a need for why we need a future geospatial information ecosystem. We need these innovative solutions to reach to the local public. We need these uh, solutions, we need that data, that information, that knowledge to reach to these people who actually can implement these solutions and drive their efficiencies, drive productivity and create a value for society and world economy. When we talk about geospatial divide, we talk about di digital divide. So a geospatial divide is something that we see constantly between developed countries and developing economies. Yesterday, when we released the Geospatial Knowledge Infrastructure Index, uh, that, is, that is sort of a blueprint on why countries need to leapfrog into a future geospatial information system. So when we look at all of these macro drivers, there are a lot of 
mega drivers in each country which drive change. So one of the key things that Dr. Zafar also pointed out is dig digital technology advancements. I think all of us can agree that technology is advancing at a much, much rapid pace than anything else. And it's very difficult for all of us to keep pace with the technology. So digital technology advancement is, is different in one country, it is different in another country, it is different all over. And with the pace of the innovation, it is important for countries to leapfrog and understand what those technologies mean and how they will impact the future geospatial information ecosystem. There are new geospatial data sources. There are mobile phones, there's crowdfunding, there's VGI, there are autonomous vehicles. There's so, so many new things that are coming up. When we look at geospatial data at its core, there are issues to consider. Data integrity, data privacy, data interoperability, with different, with more workflow integration, data interoperability and data standards become key. The focus on strategic national priorities and SDGs. Each and every country is focusing on achieving the 2030 uh, sustainable development goals. That is the focus of each and of every country, but yet there are national pri priorities for every country. And that makes it important for countries to recognize the geospatial, inf what, what is it that they want in their future ge geospatial information ecosystem. There is an important role, there is an evolving role of the national, uh, the federal geospatial data providers, the survey, the survey and mapping organizations, the geological agencies, the earth observation agencies, how they are transforming from not just being a data and a product provider, but they are transforming to be a knowledge ready center. They have a crucial role to play in uh, establishing regulatory frameworks. They have a crucial role to play in uh, making sure that there's a co-creation of innovation and creative products. Apart from that, the user uh, demands are changing. For all of us who are working in this sector, we know that the user demands with regards to geospatial data and information, with regards to geospatial knowledge is consistently evolving, it is changing. There is a progression towards it being a multi-stakeholder ecosystem. The geospatial information ecosystem is not limited anymore to geospatial professionals. It's gone much more beyond that. It involves each and every individual, even a 12-year-old child who presented in one of the side events. There is a need for the future geospatial information ecosystem to take into consideration the business models, the evolving business models, the need for analysis and automated workflows, and one of my favorites, unearth the economics of geospatial. There is a need for us to have metrics which can evaluate how a future geospatial information ecosystem is being implemented and what is its role going to be going forward for each country. So when we look at it from, an, uh, from, from a technology perspective, at this point, we talk about artificial intelligence, machine learning, deep learning, cloud, big data. All of those technologies are somewhere, every, all of us have understanding of those technologies. But then there are new technologies or new tech terms which are coming up, such as metaverse, digital twin, geobim. While these, technolo these technological terms are being implemented in uh, many of the countries, in some countries it is not. And that requires that the future geospatial information ecosystem takes into consideration uh, takes into consideration these all aspects, the market drivers, the technology drivers, the priorities of the users uh, into consideration so that there is no geospatial divide in the future. It is important to take all of this into consideration so that we can leapfrog from first generation to the future generation, which is from data, product, to knowledge-based, and move up the value chain to wisdom. In the knowledge management cognitive pyramid, we, the SDIs were at a level of data and information, and now with the geospatial knowledge infrastructure, uh, we are trying to address the knowledge-based uh, the knowledge -based part of the pyramid. But there is a scope to go beyond and be at the ecosystem level of wisdom. So when we look at it, we see that 
from SDIs, there is GKI, and there is a future geospatial ecosystem. I define future geospatial ecosystem as something that, 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 that will require very advanced level of technologies, which will have Web 4.0, which will have machines as an important part of the stakeholder ecosystem, but very crucial for countries to take, to leapfrog to a wisdom level stage. However, there is a, there is a framework called geospatial knowledge infrastructure, which is a complex but interconnected ecosystem, which talks about, which brings together the user stakeholders, which brings together the societies, which brings together, uh, which brings together the analytics, the knowledge, and focuses on the knowledge bit of the future geospatial eco information ecosystem pyramid, the knowledge management pyramid. With that, thank you so much. Thanks. Um, thank you, Ananya. So I guess a bit of a reality check is we're moving our community, geospatial information, mapping organizations around the world are moving beyond SDIs, as Zafar spoke about. And that's one of our drivers. Another driver is the way that technology and industry sectors are also moving very, very rapidly towards digital transformation. And we think about, as Ananya mentioned, all of these different sectors moving very, very rapidly. And how do we keep up and how does that work? This is reality. And at the same time, we're saying we need to bridge the digital divide. How do we bring those furthest behind with us? And all of these different elements make what we talk about very, very complex when we think about this ecosystem or nervous system. It's really difficult and it's not easy. So. What we'd like to do now is get Dr. Leslie Arnold to talk a little about, a bit about that bridging and what some of this future might look like in this discussion. So Leslie, the floor is yours. Thank you, Greg. Thank you. First slide, please. What have I got? OK, I'm sorted. Thank you so much for being here. I'm just going to show you this uh, diagram. There's many ways of looking at this future ecosystem. And this diagram looks at it from the perspective of the internet and how it has evolved. Where do our spatial data infrastructures fit in the internet and now the internet of things and the web of data? So on your right, you can see spatial infrastructures participating in Web 2.0 environment, um, you know, via the cloud. And, and Anya and Zafar have talked about that interaction. Interaction, it's bi-directional. We've then moved on, and we're now uh, in developing system of systems, which is interconnecting different applications, different data, uh, on a on a, a higher level. And that integration has helped us to produce knowledge and it's being used by policymakers to make decisions. But as we've moved along, we've actually got further and further away from developing countries because a lot of this technology is expensive. But we do have the web. The web, the Google Maps is available to everyone. Imagery is global now and as much of it is available to everyone. But how do we tap into that and tap into that in a way that we're using an infrastructure that is inexpensive? So this is where there's a paradigm shift needs to take. And I want to show you that it's really at this point where we're moving from human readable data to machine readable data. Uh, and that's what I want to talk today about. It's about knowledge on demand. So it's one aspect, one aspect of the ecosystem. So we're talking here about customer experiences. It's this knowledge on demand. Everything happens immediately. And of course, we've got this mesh of apps already sitting on top of our infrastructures and ecosystems. There are two types of um, 
uh, knowledge on demand applications, the Uber type applications, the fixed applications, the customer is well known and the design is well suited for that customer. And then you've got these open applications where you don't actually know what answers people are seeking. And of course, Siri, Cortana and Alexa, you'll know all them. They're the type of open apps where you can ask the questions. I wanna talk about these open apps because it's the open apps. And, and Miss Desi mentioned it yesterday, the farmer in the field in Ethiopia wants access to information about how much to fertilize that property. And we know, and our farmers in Australia have applications that tell you how much fertilizer. So we have the knowledge, we just don't have it in a form that it's accessible to everyone. So the applications like Siri can answer these simple questions, complex questions are more difficult. What do I mean by that? If I ask Siri, I'm the Kenyan farmer wanting to know what's the best crop this year? Where am I likely to get some value? Um, that's what I get from Siri. It's a bit of indication, I have to go and do my own research. So we need to move further and actually deliver knowledge. Okay, so how do we do that? We have to teach machines what we know as geospatial professionals. We know the processes, we just haven't put it in a way that a machine can understand those processes. So the processes are, how does it interpret the question? We're using AI, we're using natural language processing, but do we have all the geospatial terms? Uh, we're finding the right data. We have to search for that data spatially and according to a theme. And we've got to be able to find the data, and a lot of the data is locked away behind those SDIs and it's not, ma not machine readable. Once you find the data, you've got to understand it. And this is where data vocabularies, ontologies come into play. They're the ones, they're the data models of the future. They don't sit in your GIS, they sit on the web and they're associated with a piece of data. Machines find the data and they find the rules. And then, of course, we can uh, put on the web as well process ontologies or rules that allow data to be processed one step at a time. And again, as we as people have to be able to tell the computers how to do that. And of course, return a result. So uh, here's an example one of my students has done. We looked at the whole supply chain. One student did find and search. This student says, right, well, I've got five data sets. Which one's accurate? And uh, has pro created a process to conflate that data and teach the computer how to do it to come up with that single uh, source of truth. It can be done. There is some low-hanging fruit. And in the first circle here, the 2D and what I would call the 4D questions, Siri answers really well. The 4D is the monitoring because usually at a point in time you want to know what is now, what is now, what is now. Monitoring is quite low hanging fruit. Um, and then we've got the GIS operators, well computers can understand them and then we move to those 3 and 4D questions uh, where you really need to have elevation and they're far more complex. So this is the ecosystem. We're moving from spatial data infrastructures, interacting with Web 2.0 um, and the, uh, this, this web of data, which is the future ecosystem. How do you do that with our current SDIs? You'll be familiar with this. This is a human accessible SDI, multiple agencies, servicing the needs of multiple customers. And now this is the future. We've got multiple agencies. Uh, in addition to this traditional model, are uh, also exposing data to the web. And we've got all these applications out there that are able to access and use that data on the fly. And typically it's done just simply by a broker. Okay, so the question is, with this ecosystem, do we actually give it a name? After all, this whole web of data and the web of data, which is no question, it's called the web of data, um, there are many ecosystems. Wikipedia is an ecosystem. Uh, it's an encyclopedia. We've got our e-commerce and marketing ecosystems. Our health, 
ecosystems. There's a lot of linked data out there, linking health, our digital libraries uh, and standards in that has really taken off and they've done it really well in the education sector. Accommodation, think um, uh, hotels dot combined or whatever the platform is. What's called. Uh, look, that's all an ecosystem, and of course, so is the metaverse. But the metaverse is the only one that's really got a name, and of course, it's looking at animation, social, um, uh, uh, a social forum using three-dimensional rooms, of which geospatial plays a part. We all know our digital twins have can participate in the metaverse. What we're doing though, we keep talking about integration and geospatial is part of that, eco, has an ecosystem and it is the major integrator across a number of ecosystems in the web. So do we give that a name is one of the questions. We're already using multiple names at the moment. Uh, you'd be familiar with these. We've been doing it for about 10 years now. The newer one, of course, is Geospatial Metaverse, Semantic Web Geosystem, GeoWeb, Geosemantic Web, GeoCubes Universe, GeoNow, the, the Geospatial Web, and Geosocial Universe. So there's many ways, and researchers have been trying to find their place in this ecosystem for quite some time. Um, that's a discussion for later, I think. So what are we saying the Geoverse is? I can't read my thing there, sorry, I turn my back. Uh, it's not a new name for the SDI. SDIs will exist now and in the future in the ecosystem. Um, and they'll all co coexist for, for a long time together. Uh, it's not a business name. There are business names. There's a book of poems called Geoverse. It's out there. This is a dictionary word we're looking for uh, and a brand to actually start developing these processes uh, moving forwards. I'll leave it there because I think this is going to be good for some discussion. Uh, anyway, thank you for listening. Thanks, Greg. Thanks, Lucy. Right. Thank, thank you, Leslie. Um, yeah, that's fine. No worries. So that sets a bit of the context and the frame. And I guess the question is, why are we sort of talking about this? And, and really what it comes down to is a, a process in, in the um, Intergovernmental Committee meeting in August on UNGGIM, this was discussed. And really part of that was saying, we need to go out and engage, we need to consult, we need to see what our community thinks on some of these elements. And and then work out what some of this evolution is going to look like and, and then how do we actually consider some of this. So with that framing, I'd like to now invite um, five more people up to our panel, which I think we, we saw briefly on a slide there just a moment ago. So if I can, I'd like to invite um, Dr. Barb Ryan, who's the Executive Director of the World Geospatial Industry Council, up to the table. I would also like to invite uh, Ms. Maisyan Hicks, who's the Director of Geospatial Information Division in the Lands and Survey Department of Fiji, not only a developing country, but a small island developing state. Welcome, Maisyan. Mr. David Henderson, our keynote from yesterday, is the Chief Geospatial Officer from the Ordnance Survey of the United Kingdom. Ms. Ingrid Vandenberg, who's the Director General of the National Geographic Institute of Belgium and our UNGGIM co-chair. And finally, but not least, Mr. Sanjay Kumar, who's the founder and CEO of Geospatial World in India. So welcome. Pretty esteemed bunch of folks, right? Thank you. Um, and this is really about some of our thought leadership and, and what we, we're going to do. I'm just going to ask a, a few brief questions of our panel and we'll let um, Zafar and Leslie and, and Ananya reply if needed. But I would also, as we go through just a, a quick round of questions, hope that you may also want to engage in this as well. So at any time, please feel free to move up to a microphone um, and if you can just station there, and hopefully I'll be able to pick that up, and we can then have questions from the floor at the same time. 
But I'm going to start with you, David. Are we going in the right direction? And if so, and we think about this, we're going in the right... What does that look like, in your view? Well, thanks. Thanks for that. Um, <laughs> and I know you're prepared already because you did a brilliant talk yesterday. Yeah. So, um, come on. Look, I think this is a really important conversation for us to be having. And I think, certainly, I'm commending the work that our colleagues have presented to us this morning, and, and thank you for that. I think it's a difficult conversation for us to have because it points to a, a very different future from the one that we've come from. And I, I guess my own observation is one that I think we're still finding out and still discovering what that looks like. So I, I, see the, I, see, I see it more as a journey than a destination at this point in time. I, I worry a little bit, um, just to be maybe controversial, um, that if we think that the geospatial ecosystem is the thing, rather than thinking about the ecosystem itself and our place within it, then I worry that we perhaps endure a conversation that geospatial is in some way special, which of course it is, but maybe not in this context. So I think I really, I wrote down a couple of things actually. I mean, I, I think so far your, your comment that the ecosystem is dynamic is absolutely right. It feels at this stage, it's almost organic. It's still growing. We need to learn to grow with it. I think um, we need to think about, from my perspective, the role of our data in enabling the ecosystem to be effective um, and perhaps worry less about it being some sort of special node in its own, its own right. But I think, you know, we need to be thinking about the characteristics of our contribution, if you like, um, our technologies, our data, our services, so that that wider ecosystem thrives um, and is geospatially enabled and represents geography in the way that we would hope it to do. But I think for me, it's, it's, it's more about that enablement, um, less about preserving geospatial as a thing in its own right. And I think, you know, that, I think that does come through in all of the talks we had this morning. Um, but in answer to your initial question, I think we are going in the right direction. It is a, it is a conversation that we must be having um, and look forward to continuing it. Yeah, and I guess if I can just summarize that, is that we are growing, we continue to grow. And are we an enabler or we are a driver for some of this change? Or, and where do we fit in some of that paradigm? is going to be really important. Um, so if we move to, because a lot of this is about a, I guess, a, a technology focus and, you know, the fact that we become enablers as a result of where we see digital transformation and technology transformation. Oh, okay. Thank you. Sorry. Um, so from a, a developing perspective, a developing world perspective, Maisian. So in, in that context, how do you see some of the, how, what, what do you think from, from your experiences, and they're, they're pretty, pretty um, well-established experiences, what are some of these challenges? Like, you, you know, when you just think about even some of the basics of when we're trying to talk about data and integration and technology and SDIs, what do you see as some of those challenges being when we think about this idea of jumping ahead in terms of an ecosystem? Uh, thank you, Greg. Mbulovinaka, uh, everyone. I'm very happy to be here this morning. I'd just like to focus on three areas in terms of uh, uh, challenges uh, from a developing country perspective. Uh, one of it is, uh, the first one is engaging leadership. Um, in, in terms of getting them to understand the value of uh, geospatial information and what it can do, uh, for them, for, for our country, Thanks. in terms of our, meeting our national development priorities, meeting the uh, development agenda, the goals. Also getting them to understand, uh, because we also have to compete uh, for their attention. Uh, from a developing country perspective, that's something that's uh, often a challenge for us. Uh, there is a lack of understanding on what geospatial information is all about and what it can do for them. Uh, but one of the things was the COVID pandemic has really brought geospatial information uh, center stage for Fiji. 
and it has shown what it can do, the value of uh, geospatial in supporting uh, how we are able to address many of our national issues. The second one that uh, for us is uh, our partnership uh, versus competition. Um, mm. We, in, from our perspective, we, we like to develop more partnerships, but we also understand that we have to compete uh, for attention and uh, not just compete, but there are other competing uh, sectors and industries out there uh, and that makes our work a little bit difficult. But we, we try to work and ensure that our partnerships are developed and maintained. Uh, in terms of our leadership, uh, there are times when there's a change in leadership and when that change comes, we have to be able to uh, make a network, develop that partnership once more and bring them up to speed on what uh, geospatial is all about and the value of geospatial information. And lastly is the support, the right kind of support. For those of us in the developing nations, one of the things we experience is that there's a lot of offer for support to be able to uh, address certain situations. But at times, the right kind of support is not there uh, in terms of uh, capacity building, um, to be able to meet our national geo geospatial activities in order to meet our national development priorities. Uh, while we appreciate offer of support, it's sometimes not the right kind of support that we actually need so that we can move things forward. Uh, that's all for me. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Mei And I, I very much, I think we all can resonate when we think about leadership. Um, and the fact that we do need leadership and we can't do this alone, we need to have partnerships, we need to collaborate, we need to work together and particularly in the developing world that comes with support but it's got to be the right support. Um, and these are, these are topics that I, I know are very close to the work that we do, Ingrid, in UNGGIM. So just from your perspective, when we think about some of these at the moment, what do you think are some of the ideas on what are we doing now that works well and what should we be thinking when we contribute to the future in some of these areas? Well, um, I think what we do very well is to share the knowledge and share the experiences. I've heard in this conference people talk about why it didn't work. So we also share our failures, which is much more instructive than sharing your success. So I think that is important, the sharing of knowledge, the sharing of experience, and I'm really convinced that it is uh, a good thing that we do that. And the frameworks that we develop together, we share them as well. We make sure they are accessible, we translate them, and this work is not done by the UN, this is work that's being done by member states not for themselves, but to help others. And I think that's very important to show how our community wants to work together so that everybody can go forward and no one is left behind. And I think that's the most uh, important takeaway for me. Thank you. Um, and I'll just also remind our audience, if you want to ask a question, please just go up to a microphone and hopefully we'll be able to pick, pick up the fact that you're there at any stage. Um, thanks, Ingrid. Barbara, Geospatial Industry Council. Um, you, from, I guess, through your lens and your experiences, what are some of the things we should be thinking about as we move forward? What is some of this going to look like? What's the best thing we can achieve as we think about this evolution and this balancing act between being enablers and drivers, being able to have leadership and partnerships, but also at the same time, how does UNGGIM start driving some of that? And how does potentially the Industry Council look at some of that? Um, There's a lot in that, right? Yeah, yeah, it is. So <laughs> thanks, thanks, Greg, for that. And thanks for the invitation. Uh, and the presentations um, this morning. 
<clears throat> yes, so just for everybody in the room, uh, we, the World Geospatial Industry Council, are, we're a not-for-profit organization, but you have to be a private sector company to join WGIC. So when I think about our interaction um, with you and GGIM, the fact that you formed a private sector network is real good. It's kind of loosely coordinated. And I think therein lies one of the challenges globally with all of our international governance mechanisms. These are government games, full stop. They are parties that come to coordinate internationally. So whether it's UNGGIM, whether it's the Conference of the Parties, uh, they are driven by government processes. And for most of you that know me in the room, I have spent 48 years largely on the public sector side. So honestly, I think I've got a fair amount of credibility in this area. The contributions that the public sector make are absolutely essential but we've got to create some venues that are actually linked in with many of the messages you heard from every single presentation this morning that we need more collaboration and we need more integration. And that collaboration is not just on the public sector side, but it's on the private sector side. It's with academia, it's with civil society. And so we just need a better mechanism, better mechanisms for mm -hmm. that to occur. For me, um, the role that WGIC plays is essential because whether it's in UNGGIM or whether it's gonna be in Egypt in another month with the Conference of the Parties, um, governments, people, society are sub-optimizing the solutions that face this earth if we only look at public sector assets. We've got to do a better job of bringing private sector data, services, tools, and products to the solution marketplace. And we just don't have good governance mechanisms to do that. We've had some success as a not-for-profit gaining access to those venues because it's easier for a not-for-profit organization than a private sector entity to get in, but somehow we need to have a voice for the private sector because there are substantial products that can be delivered to the solution. And just one other thing, we had experience with a report that we issued on greenhouse gas monitoring from space, and the message to the last conference of the parties in Glasgow was, you governments need to continue to invest in your public sector agencies whether it's the mapping agencies, the statistical agencies, your space agencies. They were here 20 years ago. They're gonna be here in all likelihood 20 years from now. But the private sector can bring in increased spatial, spectral, or temporal resolutions to these solutions. And if you don't take account, if you don't take that into account, either with policies to bring that data in or services more, uh, uh, more appropriately or more meaningfully, you are sub-optimizing your solutions to these global societal problems. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Bob. And and we we then get to the point as we tend to is that policy and decisions and governance is driven by governments has been for decades and probably will for decades ahead, but change. We, we tend to react slowly in governments to change, which has been driven by industry. Um, and how do we balance some of that? Sanjay, from a... From Greg, a, can I just interrupt one? Yes, yeah, sure. I just want to applaud what you just said or amplify what you said. Appropriately so. The role of government is to establish those policies. Exactly. Okay, to protect all citizens, not just one segment of society. That's appropriate. But I think what we saw in these presentations earlier today is that policy setting could be done more collaboratively, more openly, bring more stakeholders yeah. to the table, but recognize it's the role of government to establish those policies. Yep. And, I, and I guess too, part of that is that it's a bit like as we talk about bridging this digital transformation divide is that is perhaps as we move forward more and more with, with industry and leaping in some of these technologies, is to a degree, like developing countries, is government also being left behind in terms of its policy as well? And what does that look like? And how do we catch up? Or how do we maintain some of that? 
Um, Sanjay, from a, I guess you have a, you probably have one of a, the most unique um, concepts here around your experiences, not only as the, as the chair of the private sector network of UNGGIM, but as, as geospatial world, where industry's heading, and, and, and what should we do about this? What, how do we fix that dilemma? Should we think about changing what we do, or do we continue to keep doing what we're doing? I don't know. What does industry think on some of this? Or don't uh, they at all? Well, uh, thanks, Greg, uh, for this question. You know, first of all, I must say that we need to open ourselves, uh, open thinking. Open thinking when you're talking of ecosystem or future ecosystem is that are we ready to think openly that what is the broad ecosystem. So are we willing to bring those players who are important stakeholders of this ecosystem into our tent? I think in last few years, there's been a big change in that aspect. I would be very privileged to say that in 10 years, I've seen the situation where our governments and private sector have started talking to each other very well and they trust each other. So I think we have a place where the trust, which is very important aspect, is kind of taken care of. And that's been process, uh, that's been possible only because of the fact that several institutions like yours has recognized that need. Now looking at are we doing enough? It depends. Where do you see from? If you see from a perspective of geospatial world, uh, an organization which has been kind of facilitating extendability of ecosystem or engagement of geospatial industry throughout its 25 years of evangelism, I would say not. We're not doing enough. And uh, we're not recognizing some of the fundamental uh, changes which we are seeing around us. And we're not recognizing that the role of our profession is phenomenal. It's phenomenal. Nothing works in digital age without our contribution. So A, that understanding and appreciation of our profession uh, in a broader you know, manner is very important. Second is uh, we have to be very open to uh, you know, welcome, embrace other players in our tent. And third is recognizing the fact that geospatial is, you know, it's all about simplifying complexities. What it does, it it provides a third dimension to the complex world. And that third dimension gives the power of visualization, which means simplifying the complexities and amplifying the impact. So that's the kind of vision which we see of our industry. But you know, another thing which I have been realizing uh, in the last couple of months or a year is the fact that geospatial industry is at a transition stage. Even recognizing that fact that we as an industry are at a transition stage is very, very important. And if we recognize that, then we, are we need to look at creative destruction. So we need to destruct to create something. And that would be the way forward, whether we do it proactively or we actually become a part of respondents. It's going to be a world which will be creatively destructed. Our industry will be creatively destructed. It's being destructed to create something new. And that's what you see in uh, those young startups. They don't really talk about several things which we discuss, but they do, do those things which actually simplify the complexities and amplify the impact. And uh, that creative destruction is something which is, which is very much around us. And uh, so 
that geospatial transition, when we talk about energy transition, we are looking at geospatial transition uh, and we are looking at creative destruction. So the ecosystem is expanding like anything. And if we really want to make a good sense out of, uh, and I'm coming to the GGIM program, good sense out of that, out of those initiatives, then we need to look at understanding the national priorities and the changes taking place in those national priorities and then looking at how creatively we can, as a community and a profession, can make that uh, contribution in supporting those priorities. So political level engagement and business level engagement is very important. And if you want to do this, then you have to redefine your uh, you know, definition of industry. In my opinion, industry is a word which includes academia, government, users, and private sector. So industry is not a synonym to private sector or commercial sector. We use the words like mining industry, tourism industry, or uh, you know, energy industry construction industry, when we talk of those industries, we do not make distinction between private sector and government sector. So the creative destruction will actually start from uh, creatively recognizing that we are at a place where we are in the transition from of definition of ourselves. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Sanjay. And, and I think, Ingrid, you wanted to make a comment, but I, I think one of the challenges we have here on one hand is, is what, as David said, you know, are we enablers and we, we actually, we, we basically sit in, sit in the room of, of, of responding to what some of that, those industry sectors might need. You know, we talked about climate yesterday, but, you know, on one hand, we're enabler, but on the other hand, how do we actually put ourselves in a better position for some of this? Um, but at the same time, different industry sectors are going to move on anyway. And, and I want you to just to respond to that so far in a moment. Oh, we've got a question. Can, thank you, Andy. Can I just let Ingrid, because I know Ingrid put her hand up. Can we go to Ingrid, then to you, Andy, and then Savar on some of that? So, Ingrid, over to you. Yeah. Thank you, Andy. Well, uh, what I was, what was popping in my mind all the time, and so you have to say this, is that I think we are too much thinking of the geospatial ecosystem as a closed ecosystem turned onto ourselves. And we are not a closed ecosystem. And if we are, we are dead. So we have to be the soil of the ecosystem of the total data ecosystem. And the soil is important. It's the roots. It's where you are. It feeds. It anchors and it does a lot of things but people don't know it's there and so when you are an unexperienced farmer you will try to do something and it won't work because you don't know your soil but uh, it's I think that's how we should see ourselves we are the dirt the soil nobody takes care nobody matters but we are so important and so we have to to start seeing ourselves as the underlying thing in many other ecosystems. Like you said, uh, there are so many other sectors. They do geo, they just don't know that it's geo. When you talk to children, they think, oh no, geography, that's not interesting. But when you talk to them about Minecraft or Snapchat or uh, going to hunt for Pokemon, that's geodata underpinning their activity and they don't see it like that. So this is, I think, what we have to do, is come out of our soil and pop up like the mole making a heap and saying, hey, here we are. We are doing things that are of importance to you. Thanks, thanks, Ingrid. And, and ensuring everything else grows from that. Yes. Um, Andy, um, question, please. So um, I'm Andy Coos, I'm an independent consultant, um, and uh, I'd like to go back to something that Leslie actually raised, um, it's the Geoverse, um, and I think that that encapsulates um, one of the areas where we, we have an issue. It's been alluded to several times. We need to make things simple. We need to make sure that, that uh, what we do is understood by a much wider audience. 
And this comes back to one term that I just want to throw out there that we all know, uh, but I don't think we're very successful within this industry at doing, and that's branding. What is our brand? Um, and I'd be very interested to hear from uh, the, uh, um, uh, the panel um, what, their, what their thoughts are on this, because it, to me, it encapsulates quite a lot of the problems that we have going forward. Yeah, th thanks, Andy. And that was something that I had here noted as well, is, is are we actually simplifying the complexities or not? And are we making ourselves more complex but not even knowing what our brand might be? That's a really good question. I'd like the panel to, to think about that just um, in just a moment. Um, you know, what is that brand? What is that future looking like? But just coming back so far, just some of that sort of industry government thinking and around, are we, are we making this complex? Or should we be simplifying it? Or do we really not know? Do we really not know ourselves? Uh, thanks, Greg. Um, I'll drop on from the experiences that I deal with global governments and observe uh, from um, what's happening. Just stepping back and seeing, looking into our own community, governments thinks digital twins is really good and announces a program of works that we are going to tender for digital twins. Has private sector been consulted in what exactly this mission of digital twins needs to achieve? Who are the users of digital twins? What can R&D offer in escalating uh, sorry, in, in providing these digital twins uh, in, in, a, in a different way. So usually in, in, in this sort of process, there's always a leader somewhere who has been influenced on a technology or for example here, Geoverse, and they think Geowork is going to help their country, for example. That's good. We have enabled, put a hook. But in order for the Geoverse to be implemented, and be socialized and benefit out of it, that inclusiveness of getting across the private sector, the academia, and talk about nation building, what do we going to take advantage of this geoverse can help, right? So, so this needs to open up, as, as Ingrid said, um, we are the soil and we need to put some fertilizers and probably the fertilizer, some of the ingredients or nutrients, it's private sector that can help accelerate the growth there. And I just recall what yesterday the Honorable Prime Minister said, we are sharing this planet and we should be able to share our best practices and also thoughts in nation and global building. And that's what we need to see it. And, and that will happen slowly and, and everyone has a role to play. Yeah, thank, thanks, Safar. And Leslie, I'm going to give you the first, first option on some of this brand. But, I, you know, we had a discussion on Monday um, with the, the side event with the private sector network and with academia and the industry council around these discussions around what government should do, what industry should do, what the private sector should do, what academia should do. And, and it comes back to something Barb mentioned right at the start there. It was also, we, we just need to be able to collaborate a lot more as well because we're not doing that so well in terms of who should do what and what does that look like? Um, and is there a brand that goes with that? Leslie, I know you've been very passionate about thinking on what that brand is. So I'm going to give the floor to you to have a think about that first off. Um, Thank you. And then to David. Thank you. So, firstly, uh, picking up on the term, thanks, Andy, as, uh, you mentioned the terminology. I just want to infrastructures are built, ecosystems evolve. When we talk about digital twins, their infrastructures, they contribute to the ecosystem. They'll only contribute to the ecosystem if they're machine readable. I just want to get that across. Um, so, that ecosystem, and for all public sector, government to get behind it and start taking the advantages of these new financial models. I mean, you can directly link a government agency with a private sector uh, and share without exchange money. I'm going to share my land use data 
with you, Imagery Company, to put out some analytics that will benefit the farm farmer in Kenya and plus other, and, uh, and then you in return will share some imagery that I might use in a different way. This, it's going to be really different, and I think I would like to see it attract the trillions of dollars that the, the metaverse is. Uh, metaverse is gaming, it's going to market in there, but SDGs are really important, and I think that that's that's the, the geoverse, and I think we've got a, a huge competition out there with uh, people moving into IT, not taking up geospatial. Let's make it a bit more sexy than it is. So, yes, I think we should give it a name and stand behind it and work towards something. Anyway, that's my opinion. Thank you. <laughs> thanks. Thanks, Leslie. And I'll just give the floor to David. I don't think there's only questions at the moment. I actually had a discussion last night at dinner. Oh, there is? Apologies. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Um, yes, we'll go to you first. Thank you. Yeah, hi. Uh, my name is Manar. I am from Neo Geo Info Technologies. Uh, we have been talking about when in the future and how uh, countries have to collaborate and how uh, uh, when we talk about village also, we kind of uh, cross the boundaries of the political countries and all that. And also we kind of um, uh, say that uh, how government should facilitate a lot of this policy building and kind of things. But we have not, uh, uh, see one, there is an inherent uh, uh, risk of, uh, when we talk about geospatial, it actually uh, reveals your uh, positional uh, uh, thing. I mean, where you are, what, uh, at, I mean, with the technologies even going into centimeter level accuracies, uh, it is actually exp exposing me uh, or my, the infrastructure which, which, is, which, is, which can be a high risk infra infrastructure to the whole world, um, which is a high risk for nations. I mean, we, we all want the world to be one, uh, one, but then we are not. I mean, there is, there is a huge, uh, uh, there are wars going on in the world. I mean, people are fighting. So, in this uh, sense, what I am saying is, I am not trying to churn the ocean, but what I am trying to say is, uh, are there any thoughts in trying to provide the benefits of this versus the risks or the, uh, or the, uh, the, or the challenges which the governments will be facing when they are writing the policies. Uh, what are the huge benefits which the nations will derive out of uh, uh, democratizing and opening up for the whole world and making it really in the sense like uh, one global village kind of thing. Otherwise, uh, what will happen is we will keep talking, but government will be impedimented with uh, not doing those kind of things. I'm not sure if I communicated my idea. No, thank you. Um, yes, I think, and if we just, just take, interpret that briefly, it's really about the benefit versus the risk in making geospatial information more readily available across all levels of, of society. For and the government? From the government or for the government? For, yeah, yeah. For, no, the government, when they are making those decisions, those are the challenges or the risks which they will be looking at. And for them, we have to feed them with yep. information in such a way yep. that your risks are outweighed by the benefits what, what you're deriving out of opening it up. Yep, yep. and there's yep. a lot of interpretation in that as well. Thank you. That's a good question. And I'll let our, our panel think about that in a moment. But I just, David, you had a point you wanted to make. And then I'm going to ask Ingrid to also just respond about that risk benefit as well. And David, you may too, from an ordnance survey perspective. Yeah, for, sh for sure, Greg. Thank you. And I value the question, actually. I mean, there's a big conversation there about value and impact. And I think that, in many respects, is related to something Andy was pushing on. I was not so much come back on Andy, but it, it triggered a thought of, of my own, I guess, when I was listening to it. So I think it feels to me, in my earlier comment, that we're at a point in time where we're redefining our role and what we do in future. And, and I think, for me, this conversation is as much about strategy and vision as it is about anything else at this point in time. We're trying to re-establish what we believe we are trying to achieve as a community. And I think, Barbara, I agree entirely with your sort of, I guess, overarching theme, which is, you know, we, we won't do this on our own, whether we're public sector, whether we're commercial, or whether we're indeed citizens. And it, there's something about all of those different stakeholders and actors working together. I, I, I think I worry at this point, to Andy's question on brand, whether we focus on brand before we've agreed what our purpose is. <laughs> and I think related to strategy and vision, where you start with is purpose. So what is it we're trying to achieve? We're not anymore trying to produce data and just saying, 
here's some great data. And if I, I think I was probably on record back in the summer of saying, as a national mapping agency, it used to be quite easy. Our job ended when we produced the map and published it. I don't think that's in any way <laughs> uh, fulfilling our task anymore. And so, you know, relating some of those comments together, we need to be more engaged with where we have value and where we create impact and work backwards from that. That, to me, starts to speak to a purpose. Um, and from that purpose, to Andy's point, I think you, it is important you have a brand of sorts because that brand is what we then talk about, is what we communicate, is what we share. And, you know, I, we already talked about the limited engagement opportunities we have to bring our stakeholders on board. Our language needs to be simple. We are marketing a message, but I think the, the, the message that we're marketing is as much our purpose and, and how we believe we can have impact going forward. And I think there are better people than perhaps me, certainly, to articulate that in a brand. So, so then, I guess part of the challenge in this is, so we talk about, we talk about, you know, I, I agree, we need to think about impact, we need to think about risk reward, but we're also very good at sitting in our comfort zone. And, and, and we, we're really good at not thinking big enough. Like, it's kind of like, yeah, well, do we go 5%, 10%? Or are we, you know, do we need to make a, a stepwise change? You know, you put out a challenge yesterday, you know, to come back to that point on climate. So a mapping agency is going to think about climate. It's like, no, I don't do that. And I'll just stick what I'm doing. And, and that's a risk reward. And sometimes that reward is five, 10 years down the track. Um, Maisian, from your view, I'd like, like Ingrid, I'm going to let you respond, but I just want you to have a think about that from a SIDS developing world as well, because you don't necessarily have that time. So I'll let you have a think about that in just a moment. But Ingrid, you, I know you wanted to respond on some of this from a government perspective. Yes, um, I would like to answer uh, or give some thoughts about a question on security. This is one of the big challenges when we are talking about uh, connecting everything to everything, uh, all the computers talk to each other, and then we forget that there are somewhere there's people. And those people have rights. They have right to privacy. Now, I have an iPhone, I have a, a smartphone, and I want to use it, and I want to use every, every possibility of this phone, but I don't want someone else to abuse the fact that I use it. And that's where government has to come with some rules about what is acceptable use. And that's why we have rules on privacy in data, and we have to have them in our GIA data, even more than in other data, because geodata is so powerful that even completely anonymized data can be linked together because they happen at the same time on the same place. And the place is such a powerful glue to stick things together that we have to rethink also how to do privacy. We have to consider security issues when we are talking about data out there. You cannot publish the, the way your, the lock of your house is functioning or the code to your garage. You don't want that to be published. So it's normal that there are rules and we have to make sure we, we, we have those rules and we play by the rules and we can enforce those rules. And that's, now I'm going to refer to one of the talks we heard yesterday about the space. There's a lot of uh, industry going into space, governments going into space, and there's not really good rules for space. And I think that's important because from space, more and more, we can see everything and you can get data on anything. And then there's, and now I want to, uh, there's also the fact that for, uh, it's already a long time ago that on Times Magazine was data is the new gold. Now that means that data is 
uh, very valuable also to indus industries that are built around using these data. And so they are not very eager to share because it's their capital. So that's also something where we have to rethink how can we, how can we work and open and use all that data without infringing your privacy, your secrecy, or, or your uh, security and your, your capital, be it as a person or be it as an industry. Thank you. Thanks, thanks Ingrid. I've just got a question um, from the floor. So, sorry, we've got just, so we've got two questions. Sarish will take first, and so we go to the back and then to the front. Thank you. Good, thank you, Greg. Uh, so I'm Sirish from United Nations Office for Outer Space Affairs, and before question, I would like to take uh, just one or two minutes to reflect on uh, what the point raised by uh, before about risk associated. I just wanted to tell you that uh, United Nations has published a roadmap for digital transformation and all resident coordinators in all the countries are making the countries digital ready all with ethics, the values that should be followed during the digital revolutions. I was in Philippines about a week ago and now with United Nations government is publishing a report called Digital Readiness of Philippines. So I think a lot of those things are going on just to address that point that people are aware and entire United Nations system is actually contributing to make this as a more ethical transformation because that roadmap was published with Melinda Gates and Jack Ma as a chair of that particular uh, uh, report. So that was one point. Uh, what I wanted to ask is to the panel is uh, about eight years back I was in Mongolia or many other developing countries when people were creating the map and simply uploading it on some websites and it is up to users whether to use or not. Now down the line, for example in Mongolia, in eight years they have now data cube that publishes all the maps and basically you know they have this lot of uh, cattle population and they have this data cube and app. Then there is a World Food program goes there with another program, uh, app called Prism, so early warning system. And then users are on national emergency management system and so much transformation happened in the technology, but when we ask users, how are you using it? Then they say, we don't have good infrastructure, we don't have servers and the maps are there, technology is there, but we don't know how to sustain that because players who have put that, it is gone now. Now I'm just taking one example of Mongolia, but I have been to some 35 countries like that. A lot of those portals are coming up, but the, at the end, user is still deployed with sustaining those portals because they are given by some donors and second part is, that they don't have enough frameworks to even to share. Even portals are there, they have metadata and they cannot even get the real data access. And these things get unfolded as we offer advisory missions to those countries. So what is missing? We are trying to make a lot of sense uh, and we know something, but I think this is also, I would like to know from panels, what do you think about, we are pushing it, but users are not ready really. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that, Sharish, and we'll let the panel think about that for a moment, but I really would like to take this other question as well at the same time. So, um, I, I think that, that, sorry, I think, that, that, yes, please. Thank you, ma'am. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, the three panelists use word open. Open versus close is a big question when we are trying to understand the technology, technology learning, joining and disseminating. When we are talking about the technology learning, the openness is very important. When we are trying to place the technology, geospatial technology I'm talking about with, with reference to now, what open? and what close has to be really defined. Because geospatial technology, me as a professor, I see that it has a multidisciplinary, multitasking, multi-temporal, lot of multi-word gets into that. When we are talking about uh, the geospatial technology to be used in the last mile mobility, aviation, heritage, whichever is the uh, specialization, the thing comes is that those domains are coming that this is our work. 
we are looking into that. You don't have knowledge about the transportation or aviation or something like that. You are just the, the location people, you are map people, you are doing this or that. Okay, so such kind of, I'm not talking fights and these fights are good because it comes out from the academia, it, it goes to a very, very positive direction. But this is always a question comes out that where do we stand as a geospatial scientist, technologist, whichever we call, and always Sanjay Kumar tells is a, is a, is a geospatial industry, and industry is not one which is manufacturing. It is innovating, establishing, and then manufacturing, but for the implementation, but for the societal uh, usages and the socioeconomic and environmental benefit out of that. And so I also have one more point to be raised with respect to that what we are talking about this existence or expansion. And which one we have to take as a, as a way, are we getting into expansion mode or are we getting into the existence mode? And I'm talking about, I'm thinking more about the expansion that is what is needed because this expansion can always be vertical but can be also horizontal. And if it is horizontal, the adaptation where we talk about the open would take place much into the sense. So probably this is not my question, but my confusions to the August uh, panelist, but then can be discussed about it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, thank you for those two questions. And I'm also very conscious of time. So what I'm going to do is, if I can just sort of summarize those last couple of, of questions and points, is, is partly at the heart of, of, of our problem is that on one hand, we, we, we say we need to, and I like the idea of, of around existence versus expansion. Do we just continue what we're doing or do we change what we're doing? Is it about risk? Is it about reward? And when we think about data and use and sustain and manage and expand and vision and partnerships and collaboration, and, and that's, that starts getting towards when we talk about an ecosystem, what does that really look like? There's so much to it. And in fact, the data is only the starting point, but there's all these other components to that. And, and this is part of this journey that we're on and this discussion we're on, because it's not one thing or the other. There's many, many different elements to it. Um, but, but given that we're running out of time, we've got a lot of good notes here, and I really appreciate that. But if we can just quickly, I think just, just, just uh, just 30 seconds from each of you on your synopsis on, on what that, you know, where is some of that challenge in existence versus expansion and the fact that there's a lot that we have the ability to control, but there's a lot we do not have the ability to control as well. So just through the panel, starting with Safar, your last 30 second take before we conclude. Thank you. Thanks, Greg. I think uh, it's about opening up and learning and, and lessons shared, uh, what other jurisdictions have done well. Like, I mean, we're talking about open, there are fair principles uh, around, there is locust charter uh, there. So, so all this can uh, be shared. By just sharing the knowledge, by sharing best practices, we can resolve certain things. Certain jurisdictions do well, certain jurisdictions do mistake, but people can learn from those experiences. By sharing, I think we can solve this problem just a small response to the colleague from you, and I think uh, yet another portal is a problem not only with our community, with every community there. Uh, I think the way we, we design these programs for donor agencies or things is to look into sustainability. I'm sure private sector can play a role in making the sustainability of these initiatives. Thank you, Dr. Zafar. Uh, just adding on to that, uh, a couple of things that I've al always maintained is that uh, openness is key to developing any geospatial ecosystem. And I speak more from the perspective of the user community. I think Ingrid made a very valid point that we are the soil and we need to fertilize it. And when we need to fertilize it, we need to make sure our messaging is such that other industries, be it construction, be it logistics, be it... Uh, any industry for that matter, they understand what geospatial is. Um, the second point that I would like to make is uh, on the brand, uh, brand concept and what David said as well. I think what we need to focus on is the purpose. 
Brand is important, but if the purpose is not clear, I don't think it's going to add any value in the long run. Thank you. One thing I'd like to see us not do is do what we've done well in the past, and that's work in data silos. So um, as we move to knowledge and we start creating these rules to allow these machines to answer these questions in intelligent ways, let's not let the private sector and the government start developing these things. Let's, let's um, not duplicate that. Let's work towards standards and... Um, uh, the same goals, I think. And David, you mentioned strategy and thinking and moving forward. Yeah, let's all journey together and, and avoid that. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Um, hey, I'll try to go fast. A couple things just to tie up some loose ends, Greg, if that's okay, and I hope it'll address your point. Just back to the economic analysis question, I think there is a call actually this week that there be some more standardized approaches for the economic analysis of geospatial data. We did some work in the United States with Landsat, uh, Europe where their Sentinel series picked that up. I guess what I would say is, listen, bad people are gonna do bad things with some of our data. We cannot prevent all those scenarios down the road. But the economic analysis will show you that far greater economic benefits come from broad open data on behalf of the public sector than the risks associated with some people doing bad things with that data. You can't prevent it all, so let's just kind of set the stage there. Um, I mean, in the, for Landsat, we were collecting $500 million a year. The benefits with open data went to $2.1 billion a year. That did more to change global landscape analysis uh, with that one policy change than almost uh, anything globally in that land remote sensing issue. On the private sector side, um, I think you're going to see a, a change over the next five or ten years, maybe 15 or 20, away from data as the currency of exchange to products and services. So I think to some extent we'll get out of uh, that debate. But go back to Jeffersonian principles, an informed society uh, needs to have access to that information. Um, just on the uh, Andy's question on branding, because I had actually written it down earlier, I think one of the things we have struggled with in our sector um, is rebranding. And I think that's a problem. Think about 20 or 30 years ago how much trouble we had describing SDIs to policymakers. Well, it's kind of an invisible infrastructure. It's like your road network, but it's geospatial data. And then we go to IGIF, and then we go to GKI, and now we're maybe going to the Geoverse. I think in an academic environment, it's okay to do rebranding if we can kind of tell that story. Billions of dollars have been put into branding the metaverse. Way back to Neil Stephenson's book on snow crash, I don't even know when that was written, 1990. We need to jump on that terminology. Maybe I've been reading too much science fiction, but we live in a real universe and we will be living in the metaverse. And I feel very, very strongly that we as a sector have just got to get behind that terminology and whether you use your soil analogy or whatever, but we are part of the metaverse full stop, and we got to just show our role in that. Um, and one last thing, going back to your question to Ingrid um, about the role, what you've done well with UNGGIM, the greatest thing you have done is bring the statistical community and the mapping community together, full stop. Forget all the other rebranding that's done, that has been the greatest function that you guys have served, and we need to do it because it's put it down through the whole sector. Thanks, Bob. Sorry about that. Thank you. Well, just uh, for me is uh, because of the discussion about uh, purpose and uh, branding. Uh, from my perspective, it's uh, relevance. For us here in the geospatial community, we see ourselves as relevant, but we need to continue to engage with other stakeholders so that they can understand that we are also relevant to the entire ecosystem. Uh, that's just all from me. Thank you. Thank you, and just a couple of quick observations for me. I mean, I'm really excited to be having this conversation, and I think for me, it, it points to a future where our data acts as, as an enabler. It connects people in place and place to people. It connects process to place and place to process. And it describes the world in a way that otherwise just wouldn't be possible. 
Um, and I think we need to think radically different in the sense of data connecting things rather than data just existing. I think for our data to be useful, it needs to be used. But for our data to continue to be useful, it needs to be sustained. And, and I think some of the points that were being made at the end are really important. And I think we need to get better at putting business models in place as well as delivering projects. If those projects don't then transition and become sustainable, then we'll only ever be doing initiative after initiative. What I want to, to mention, um, when we heard about uh, projects being launched and then not taken up and not continued, like the example from the UN, I think that's exactly the reason why in the IGIF we have nine pathways, because it's not just about the data or the infrastructure or whatever you want to call it, it's also about the legal system, the capacity building, the financing models and so on. So I don't think IGIF is, in the, is to be mentioned as one of the steps of uh, a database and SDI and so on. IGIF is something else. It is really a way of approaching how to do that. So that's, I think that message has to be clear to everybody. That's the cookbook. And then the second thought I want to share is about our brand. Our brand is where? The signs of where, the power of where, whatever, but where? But we do not seem to own it. We are not seen as the owners of this brand. It's becoming a generic brand. And if, if, if people ask, well, they don't really see us as the owners. And that's, I think, what we have to do. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, first of all, a clarification. When I said that simplifying complexities and amplifying impact, I did not say that it's a problem of our industry, but it's a contribution of our industry. I mean to say that simplifying complexities of the user industries and amplifying their productivity and efficiency was the meaning. And it's not that the first time I'm misunderstood. It's always I'm misunderstood and it takes the community to take five years to understand me. And uh, so moving forward that my view is geospatial transition is the reality. S creative destruction is going on and that creative destruction and transition is making this industry to be about a trillion dollar market, not economy or impact by 2030. There is no, def uh, uh, I, I mean, so there's no doubt about it. It's already $450 billion, and it's going to be $1 trillion by 2030, and that will be driven by the lot of public policy reforms which has been going on right now. Having said that, when you're talking of one trillion dollar economy or a one trillion dollar market, this would be a mainstream industry by the next three to five to seven years. Whether you want to be part of it proactively or you want to be part of respondably, that you are responding to this. And it will actually create further more things, which means that it will attract a lot of mainstream public policy challenges and opportunities which would be dealing with the trade and commerce, uh, nationalistic approach, protecting the, you know, turfs and things like that. So what geospatial world is doing is to, uh, three things, one is we are undertaking a project known as GKI and in my opinion future geospatial ecosystem will be complementing all existing, uh, you know, uh, programs and it will be a kind of geospatial infrastructure and to make that data to uh, knowledge it will be geospatial knowledge infrastructure. Second is what we are doing is building a narratives on trade and commerce. So we actually founded a organization known as Geospatial World Chamber of Commerce which actually would focus primarily and primarily and exclusively on addressing ease of doing business and trade and commerce issues. And third thing which we are doing is if you look at integrating the uh, workflows and amplifying the productivity through various reports like GeoBIM or GeoAgri or PNT and economy, we are coming with a lot of reports on that and that is the, my final word that 
these are the three things which are doing this industry is going to be an uh, industry to be proud of. Thank you. Thank you. And, and thank you for that 30 seconds, folks. I'm going to leave with 30 seconds and basically three words, purpose, relevance, and impact. And a point. Data is the new gold. Data is the new oil. Oil is a fossil fuel. Gold is not much use sitting in a bank. It's about being relevant, having impact, and being usable. I would like to thank our Brains Trust, our Geospatial Brains Trust. Um, this has been really, really exciting. Thank you so much for your contributions. Thank you for being part of this. And I would just like you to please put your hands together for our eight wonderful panelists. Thank you. Thank you.